it would be uh, a crucifix. Now, you, know, you may notice this crucifix is a little bit different from most of the ones that uh, you would see in religious use today. And the most significant difference is that Christ is alive. He's looking back at you. Uh, all of the early icons showed Christ alive on the cross. The idea is, is similar to the resurrection icon to show the triumph over death. This isn't a Christ who is waiting to die, who is suffering and, and just hasn't quite made it to death yet. Uh, this, is, uh, this is a Christ who has triumphed over death and is, is looking at us. Uh, probably the most famous uh, example of this is, is the one uh, that spoke to St. Francis of Assisi. I'm going to be saying uh, quite a bit about St. Francis. Uh, who spoke to St. Francis of Assisi and of course it was alive. A dead Christ would not speak in that way. Uh, along the sides of the, uh, of the cross are the scenes, uh, various scenes that portray the stages of the Passion. Now, uh, this is, uh, there's a little bit of three-dimensionalism here because the cross is all cut out and this typically hangs over an altar with light behind it so you get that dramatic silhouette. Uh, and in this one, the halo actually moves forward a bit. It, it stands out from the flat surface. Uh, uh, and that was, that was a very common technique. Well, St. Francis himself was the, the motive power behind the first significant change uh, in the Western way of portraying these religious subjects. St. Francis uh, told his followers that when they uh, read scriptures, they should try and picture themselves as actually being physically there. What would it be like to be there and see this? What would it be like to see Lazarus walk out of the tomb? What would it be like to see someone healed? And, and this physical uh, emphasis uh, was also paired with uh, an emotional emphasis. St. Francis said uh, that the tears of, of those who hear the preaching tells you how effective the preaching has been. And so we get a different kind of icon. Uh, what's the... Uh, this is not that much later than the one we saw before, but look at how tortured and tormented Christ, the, the figure of Christ is. Uh, we get uh, things like the Rotgen Pieta at this time, when uh, there, uh, the, the blood seems to be gushing uh, like make lodges of catching uh, out of uh, Christ's wounds. Uh, and this is deliberate to, to have an emotional impact to make people understand the vividly the suffering of Christ and to relate that to their own suffering. Uh, so this is, this is perhaps the earliest manifestation of uh, a new sensibility which was promoted not only by the Franciscans, but by the Dominicans and other uh, so-called mendicant orders, the begging orders, the friars, as distinct from the, the older uh, orders of monks. Um, it used to be customary to say that Giotto was the beginning of, of the Renaissance. Uh, I don't think that that, that can be defended, really, uh, because Giotto uh, is uh, very early, as you can see by the date, uh, and the style after him uh, rejected much of, of what he was doing. But Giotto's work is nearly always, uh, I hesitate to say absolutely always, because somebody can come up with an example I haven't thought of, but uh, it's, it's virtually always in mendicant churches. Uh, and this, uh, his most famous uh, single location for work, uh, is the Scrovini Chapel uh, in Padua, or the Arena Chapel, it's called both of those things. Um, and uh, this is the walls of that chapel, which, that chapel's about the size of the room we're sitting in. Uh, and its walls are completely covered with uh, panels uh, uh, portraying uh, the life of Christ and, and other 
religious subjects. But this uh, lamentation for Christ is still, in every sense, an icon. Uh, I have seen, uh, I looked for them but couldn't find them. Uh, uh, I've seen Russian icons of a, a later date uh, with exactly the same positions of the figures, with St. John's very distinctive uh, sweep of his hands behind uh, his back here. Um, just to identify things for you, uh, this, is, this is the Virgin Mary holding the body of Christ. Uh, I'm not sure that I'm willing to try to identify everyone else. This is St. John here. And mourning angels, look at these angels, they're writhing with horror at what has happened. They're uh, swooping around like uh, chimney swifts and uh, uh, all emotional uh, about it. But this, is, this has the same intention, uh, the intention to convey a religious truth. Giotto's art is usually presented in art history books uh, in terms of his technique, uh, because he is the first to, to this extent, uh, there are some others, uh, Cimabue and, and uh, Duccio to some extent, do the same thing, but he's the first to give such a strong sense of the physical presence of these figures. These are three-dimensional figures. They have weight. Uh, he is uh, very concerned with their emotional interactions. Uh, they all, where each one of them is looking is absolutely clear. Why that person is looking in that direction is, is always clear. Uh, the, I was not a terribly big fan of Jotos until I saw them in person. And they have an enormous religious impact uh, seen in, purpose, in person. And that was their purpose. Uh, so what we have here is a revolution in method, but not in intention. Uh, so the intention of, uh, of this work is the same uh, as in any uh, orthodox icon. But then uh, a terrible catastrophe came, uh, the Black Death. Uh, in uh, Italy it begins in 1347, uh, sweeps all of Italy in 1348, continues moving around Europe uh, up until uh, 1352. Uh, when I say it moves, uh, it was generally operating uh, in one place for uh, something like three to six months. Uh, the, the rates of death for, from uh, this plague were truly remarkable. It was customary throughout most of the 20th century to say that about a third of the people in Europe died. And I used to go in classes and, and count off, one, two, three, you're gone. One, two, three, you're gone. But that's, uh, that seems to be inadequate. The more recent research uh, says that more likely it was half to 60% of the population died. You read the accounts, uh, one of my favorite uh, ones, uh, a man who was writing a chronicle in Florence uh, died of the plague and his nephew uh, picked up and continued, he said, to record the extermination of mankind. People believed, and we have this from many observers, that this was the end of the world. It wasn't, and there's a wonderful letter from Petrarch who says uh, uh, to Boccaccio that, uh, that in the future people won't believe our testimony, they won't believe that this happened. But just a few years later, it happened again. And Petrarch wrote again to Boccaccio saying, we thought this was a one-time disaster, but now we see that this is a continuing evil. What most people don't realize is that once the plague swept across Europe uh, in, in 1348 to, to 52, it came back, it never disappeared. It was somewhere in Europe for the next roughly 150 years, every year but one. In Italy, uh, about 68% of the years, at, there's, there's, someone has actually tried to list all the years that there was plague. 
in Italy, 68% of the years uh, before 1600, in other words, throughout the Renaissance, 68% of the years had plague in Italy. And these were not minor plagues. Uh, the, uh, in, in the book that uh, I've just written, uh, Plague and Pleasure, which is, uh, is based upon, uh, uh, based upon uh, the memoirs of Pius II, Pope Pius II uh, encountered plague many, many times, and not one of the times that he encountered is in that list. So one of those plagues uh, I happened to find from a, uh, a chronicler in the same town, uh, he estimated that in Viterbo in one summer they lost 2,000 people. And that one is so small it didn't make the list. So it's impossible to think of the Renaissance period as we have in the past as a time of unending joy and happiness. It was a time of truly grim disaster. And my own interpretation, which I, is the basis of, of my book, is that uh, the Renaissance art and Renaissance literature that seems so upbeat is escapist in nature. Uh, just as if you were to try to judge what life is like for us today by Game of Thrones or something like that. Uh, there, there are a few people old enough to get this reference. It would be as if you, uh, as if you tried to look at Busby Berkeley and say that's what the Depression was like. Uh, but this is the art that we see very little of because very little has survived uh, that really depicted Italy particularly, that was the favorite subject uh, of the morbid side, as I call it, of, of uh, Renaissance art. Uh, and this one uh, is one of the first uh, at Subiaco. Uh, death is personified as a decaying body. Now it's very interesting that prior to the plague, death was not normally personified at all. Our Halloween skeleton comes out of the plague years. But they usually, at first, the skeleton became standard eventually, they preferred to portray a transi, that is, a rotting corpse. Uh, so death has put his sword into the back of this courtier, and uh, uh, Luke Ashworth Sides, who took this picture, uh, will remember that the courtier's eyes are just starting to droop a little bit, and the person with him just looks a little bit concerned. Uh, so here we have a, a, a type of art that looks to our way of thinking somewhat primitive, uh, but the emotional expressions are subtle and extremely effective. Now, most art did not go in for morbidity. You could only stand so much of that. Uh, but there is a, a big difference from the sort of thing we saw in Giotto. Giotto's art was very human, very approachable. Now you can see in this uh, uh, not particularly uh, famous picture, but a typical one, uh, representing Pentecost, that the figures all seem very distant from us. Uh, they are not in any kind of physical space. Uh, they are separated from us. They are not uh, particularly interacting with each other. Uh, there's a very hieratic, uh, hierarchical atmosphere, uh, a sense of distance that these heavenly figures uh, really don't have much to do with us and are not particularly interested in us. Uh, and there are, there are some chilling things written by people in the group of the plague uh, where, they are, where they portray God as saying, I am going to destroy mankind, and, and, and the writer begs for mercy, uh, and God says the time for mercy has passed. Uh, and so there is, there is this really stony uh, uh, response uh, in the art of the, of the later part of the uh, 14th century. The, the man who, to me, really begins the Renaissance, and, and I'm not alone in, in thinking that, is, is Masaccio, uh, who died in his uh, mid-20s. Um, and Masaccio stands really in the Giotto tradition. He is, his work is, is religious art, 
that is trying to give you a sense of immediate physical presence. Now, that has been absent for about 40 or 50 years from the death of Shoto to the first earliest painting uh, by Masaccio uh, that we have. Uh, but Masaccio's figures, again, are earthy, solid, real. Uh, they, they cast shadows, which was necessary in this picture because this is a very rare uh, scriptural moment to portray where St. Peter's shadow heals cripples. Uh, and so uh, cast shadows were an innovation, not of Masaccio's, but of someone else just shortly before. Uh, but we, what is an innovation here uh, is the perspective. Now, uh, perspective was approximated and is only approximated here too uh, for a long time. Uh, and uh, uh, it, certainly Shoto did, did that some. But uh, what's developed by a, a friend of Masaccio's, Brunelleschi, uh, is a mathematically accurate perspective. Uh, and the first painting to actually use that is the next one that I'm going to show you in, in which we'll talk about a bit. Uh, this is Masaccio's Trinity uh, in Florence, uh, probably the last thing he ever painted. Uh, and this picture uh, we knew about from Vasari, uh, who, who wrote the lives of the painters, uh, painters sculptors, and architects. Uh, and uh, we knew about this picture, but it was covered up by Vasari himself at the order of, of the uh, Grand Duke of Tuscany uh, by a later altarpiece. In the 19th century, they, they removed that later altarpiece and showed most of what you see, but not all. They only uncovered it down to here. So this upper part is the only part that uh, was known for a long time. And this is where we see uh, the one point perspective mathematically laid out in this design for a Roman chapel. Now, this composition to show the Trinity had become a tradition in the West. This, this would never have been allowed in the Eastern Church. You could not portray the, the Trinity in this way. But in the, in the West, uh, God as uh, an old man stands behind the cross, holding it up almost. Christ is on the cross, and the dove of the Holy Spirit hovers between them. You may not even know that that is the dove of the Holy Spirit, because this has been so badly damaged. This, when they uncovered this uh, fresco, they physically moved it to a different place in the church. And it's been moved back uh, to the original place. And of course, it was damaged considerably uh, uh, through all of uh, these vicissitudes. But the, what's completely new is this Roman architecture. Um, where would the Trinity be? The Trinity would be in paradise, in heaven, in some, some other worldly superior place to here. And yet, here we have an artist who's, whose whole art is about the physical. So how is he going to idealize the physical? Well, he's going to talk to his humanist friends, and he was friends with a, a number of humanists, who would tell him that the ideal was ancient Rome. That Rome in its height in antiquity was the perfect human world. And so nothing could be more appropriate as a setting for an otherworldly perfection than a Roman chapel. It's thought by some people that Brunelleschi actually drew plans for the chapel uh, and, and then mapped out with his mathematical perspective exactly how this would look. Now you're looking up at this altarpiece, uh, and so you get this dramatic recession. Uh, now you have to remember, no one has ever seen accurate perspective before this picture. So people are going to come to this, they're going to see the Trinity portrayed in a physically present way in this 
ideal chapel that looks like it's really opening up there in the wall. That's going to be a religious experience. And it was intended to be a religious experience. And we know some, some more about that intent by looking at the bottom, which the Victorian restorers deliberately ignored. In the Chapman exhibit, you will see something very, very much like this. If you are praying in front of this altar, you kneel, and right at your eye level is the skeleton. And the inscription, which I've never been able to decipher for myself, it's so damaged. Uh, nonetheless, what it says, I'm told, uh, is what I am, what, what you are, I, am, I was. What I am, you will be. So this is a warning of your death. Now there was an actual altar table that came out from this wall, supported on columns like the ones you see painted. So you would be looking under the surface of the altar. Now the surface of the altar was right here. This is Christ's blood. And it is trickling down here to precisely where the chalice would be. So the chalice on the altar would be appearing to receive Christ's blood from this very real three-dimensional uh, picture. And this memento mori staring you at the face at the bottom. Uh, I think this, this is clearly an icon. It is, it is sacred art as distinct from religious art. By religious art, we can mean but what Mr. Chapman has done. Uh, anything that portrays a religious subject would be religious art. But sacred art is trying to do with pictures what scripture does with words. Uh, and this, is, we are in the Renaissance with the first Renaissance artist and he's still doing that. But, the new perspective creates all kinds of opportunities to make all kinds of things seem real. They don't necessarily have to be religious, and we don't necessarily have to look at them the same way that we have in the past. So here we have Mantegna, the dead Christ, and you can think back to the Lamentation uh, by Giotto, uh, and uh, he's showing off how well he can do perspective. Uh, so th he actually didn't get it quite right. If you think of the figure standing up, uh, the, uh, the chest would be enormous, the head would be disproportionate, but we'll forgive him. It's, it, it, it's, uh, it's a great picture, a great exercise in perspective. I would say this is no longer sacred art, uh, because we are so conscious of the artist's skill. It's on the borderline, though. He's made the, he's made the jagged holes of the, of the nails so real. I, I don't want to judge what category this falls in, but I don't have that same problem with the next one. This is uh, St. Sebastian, one of three that uh, Mantegna painted. Uh, St. Sebastian was specifically a saint that you prayed to for the plague. He, was, he and St. Rock were the most common, uh, which was built following a plague, yellow fever uh, in our case. So this, uh, uh, the story of St. Sebastian, uh, uh, a martyrdom story, and uh, he was uh, filled full of arrows, uh, but lived, uh, and a holy woman, I forgot who she is, uh, came and took him down and restored him to life, and he had to be executed all over again in a different way. Uh, but uh, he's always portrayed uh, as sort of the human pincushion here. Uh, but uh, in, some, in some cases, there were actually holes and real arrows were inserted into the picture. Um, but this St. Sebastian, doesn't sit, doesn't have much religious resonance. Uh, the stat it's a it's basically a Greek or Roman athlete statue, uh, and uh, the Roman the ruined uh, Roman architecture is fascinating to everyone who's, who's into that, and everyone was. Uh, and uh, uh, the ruins are 
they have an iconographic intent because the ruins are supposed to show the ancient world passing away uh, with the coming of the, of the Christian uh, disposition. But look at the background. This is where I think Renaissance artists reveal the escapist aspect, and, and there are many others I could have shown. Uh, but in the background, we see mountains that nature doesn't make. Uh, and on top of them, if you did find an overhanging cliff like this, would you build a